So we are still waiting for people to come in that are not so familiar with the meat ecosystem. Uh, I believe the the, quest, the question I, I, will, I would make is already answered. I see that uh, the lecture will be recorded. Uh, yes. Where it will be available and when? It is usually available two or three days after the meeting in the IETF YouTube channel. Okay, YouTube ten, channel. Yes, okay. and if, if you go to the chat, you will find a link to the current notes. And the current notes will be updated with the video address as soon as we know that. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Good, so I think we are approaching 30 participants. Great. So I think we can start. This is the Think to Think Research Group. Uh, we are having a work meeting, which is a meeting we tend to do between our major summary meetings to get some progress on specific topics. And uh, today's topic is digital twins. Uh, I'm Carsten Bormann. Uh, I'm chairing this group together with uh, uh, Ari Karenin, and uh, I need to do a little bit of bureaucracy at the start. Um, this is my version of the so-called note well slide, uh, which tells you three things. You may be recorded, actually you will be recorded, as you can see from the red recording uh, uh, blob uh, down on the screen. Um, th there are some code of conduct rules here, which I will summarize with be nice. And there are some IPR guidelines, uh, which uh, are necessary because uh, this is uh, um, an organization that, that is not trying to, to generate some cartels and so on. Um, so we, we have to uh, follow anti antitrust uh, guidelines. You can find more information at iatf.org slash IPR. And the short version of that is that if you know about uh, patent claims to some technology and want to talk about that, you need to declare that knowledge. And this is the, the long form, the official note well um, uh, slides that, that you can uh, per use. Um, this is the code of conduct slide. And uh, finally, um, a few words about what, what we are trying to do here. Um, it's uh, easy to confuse the IRTF with the IETF, and, and that's somewhat okay because we are closely related organizations, but the research task force focuses on longer term research uh, is issues, while the IETF really focuses on, on creating uh, standards short-term issues uh, of engineering and standards making. So what we are not discussing today is uh, making standards. We might be discussing what we would uh, like to ask the IETF to make standards for, uh, but we are not a standards development uh, organization. Which doesn't mean that we don't occasionally create RFCs. These are then uh, usually overview uh, documents or documents that address specific uh, questions. Uh, we often do work on terminology because it turns out that, that it's very difficult to get work done in, in a space where the terminology isn't well defined. Um, so that, that's a typical outcome of an IRTF activity. But just, just 
getting gold set for other people to to publish their papers about also is, is very much a goal of uh, the uh, IRTF. So we have a, a notes page, which is uh, on, on the Hedgehog notes note system. Uh, the link is on this slide and in the chat um, as well. Uh, we have a Jabber connection to the chat, but you can ch see the chat on the left part of your screen if you uh, click the, the chat button. Uh, so you usually don't have to go there. And of course, we have a mailing list in the uh, research group, which uh, uh, it makes sense to sub subscribe. You will not be totally drowned with mail. We have, have a relatively low volume mailing list. Uh, and we also have a GitHub organization, and we usually have a rep repository per meeting. So this is the May 2022 meeting. So you will find the repository under 2022-05-digital twins. And th that's where we will upload uh, the slides. We will also upload the slides to the official IETF systems, which are a little bit harder to, to navigate. So this should be uh, the Ari. Thank you. Since we have many first uh, time IETFers uh, here, so just a quick note on the Meet ecosystem. So if you have any questions or comments on the presentation, you can use the join queue button uh, on the top left part of, of your screen. So just click it and you will join the queue and then we can give you, um, we, we'll, we'll let you know when it's good time for you to have a talk or that, that's the best way to join uh, for comments. Yeah, you mean the, the hand button. Exactly. We have these look, beautiful look. icons that nobody understands. <laughs> exactly. It looks like a raised hand but when you hover your, mic, your mouse over just leave queue or join queue. Great. Thank you for, for this hint. This probably should be on the slide. Um, so um, what is the Think to Think Research Group? about. Um, it's meant to be discussing research issues that, that have become of interest or still are open in uh, getting an Internet of Things uh, going. That is not ju just using the name Internet, but really uses Internet uh, technologies. And one important aspect of this is, there are many aspects, but one that's important enough to put it on the slide here, is that we are talking about low resource uh, nodes, uh, constrained nodes that uh, need to be able to uh, be part of the Internet of Things. So we focus on issues that might have opportunities for IETF standardization, uh, but of course, uh, uh, essentially catering to the, the general research community is, is of interest here. Um, as well. And with respect to the IoT, we really um, do this full stack. So we start down at the IP adaptation layer right above the radio. And uh, we, we end with application layer concerns, security concerns, um, and so on. Um, so within the organizations IRTF and IETF, uh, th there are three blobs, and, and we are part of the IRTF uh, blob. Uh, the green blob really is the, the working groups. So th there are, I think, 13 right now, just mentioning two here. Um, and there's also a blue blob, which are working groups that uh, really look less at protocol development and more at how do, do you actually run these things, how do you actually implement uh, these things. So I cannot uh, do a full discussion of the organization uh, here, but um, I think it's important to keep this in mind, and that's why I have another uh, slide here. So the IETF does the standards uh, from the adaptation, adaptation layer uh, higher on to transfer protocols and profiles for transport uh, protocols, security mechanisms, application data formats, uh, data models. We have created 16 working groups since 2005, th three of which uh, are closed because they have completed their work. That's something we tend to do in the IETF and we are done, we, we, we stop working. Um, while the IRTF is really about uh, interfacing to researchers and uh, defining programs of research, uh, getting summary documents out uh, and so on. 
So today's uh, subject is digital twins. And um, this is a concept that has become increasingly popular in particular for IoT or more general operational technology um, systems. And the idea is that there is some physical object um, that uh, being a thing in the Internet of Things, it, it is, ha also has a digital interface. Uh, but uh, that may be difficult, that may be consuming battery, that may have low bandwidth and so on. Um, so it's often useful to actually have um, another digital object, uh, which is not a physical object, but somewhere on, on a server, uh, which is called the digital twin of the physical object. So that, that is a counterpart of the physical entities. And uh, of course, the important thing is these two are synchronized, so they are twins, uh, just that, that only one of them has the physical environment as well. And uh, of course, this means that we uh, need to uh, send back and forth sensing data and, and uh, uh, control information, actuator um, uh, information. And what we want to do today um, is uh, start uh, work on digital twins in a more formal way as an activity. And the result could be that we, we uh, capture relevant terms, including a definition of digital twin in the first place, um, identify IETF technology that already solves some of the problems that are uh, important in this uh, area. And on the other hand, uh, identify gaps so we know which further standards development uh, may be uh, useful at the IETF. And on the other hand, which research op opportunities are there that would uh, be useful to have to do good standards and not, ju not just any kind of uh, standard. So today's meeting really is on the, the uh, on the level identifying questions. We are not going to generate answers um, uh, today, but it, it's really important to understand the whole gamut of questions before you start uh, answering uh, them. And of course, digital twin is, is, a, is a, a specific term, but of course we have other terms for concepts that solve related problems. So, for instance, in the REST architecture, we have proxies uh, which solve certain problems and do not solve other problems that digital twins try to solve. And even the brokers from, from the message queue world often do things that, that are related to digital twins, like recording last wishes and so on. And, of course, these things also come with some naming systems that may be important when we talk about digital uh, twins. We also do work uh, in, in the IRTF uh, about uh, implementation environments that may be useful for setting up digital twins. So things like, like edge computing or in-network computing uh, may be of interest. Maybe not so much today, but I think in the long run, we have to talk to the research groups that, that work in this space um, as well. And uh, finally, uh, digital twins uh, live and die from modeling. Uh, so if we have modeling, in particular data interaction mod modeling, uh, that we can share uh, between the digital, tw digital twin world, and we will hear later about that, that actually happening, um, then that uh, is going to help both uh, sides. And the same, of course, also is true about security. Uh, so, for instance, um, authorization is, is something that needs to be done in the physical and uh, the digital side of the, the twin system. Uh, and it helps if our um, mechanisms actually work with both. So, the plan is uh, to uh, do a quick introduction, and I'm already five minutes over time. Um, then we will uh, have uh, two talks. Uh, from uh, people who haven't had a lot of context with the I, uh, contact with the IRTF uh, before, and th there is a digital twin consortium behind that. Uh, so I'm very interested in, in hearing this uh, point of view. And uh, we will reserve a little time to do clarifying questions 
after that. So we probably don't want to go into the big discussion. We can do that at the end, uh, but uh, maybe we can um, uh, we can take questions during the talks, of course. But uh, maybe it, it makes sense to have a, a slightly larger question section afterwards. Then we switch over to what we have been doing in, in IETF and IRTF. Um, first of all, there is a network management research group that is uh, talking about a network digital twin or digital twin network. Uh, unfortunately, they had their big workshop last week. So we were a bit optimistic uh, in, in trying to get someone to talk about that. But uh, I'm going to show two slides uh, here uh, what that uh, might be. Um, then uh, I want to quickly talk about uh, uh, SDF and the ASDF uh, working group, and uh, which is a modeling approach. And uh, then we have uh, two talks uh, from people who actually are using modeling uh, technologies uh, to uh, do their work on digital uh, twins. And we have time for a discussion at the end. Okay, with that, uh, unless there are questions about the agenda, I think we can move uh, to the first talk. And I relinquish the slide. How do I do that? Uh, hi, the, I, I'm starting to share my screen. You should see that now. Yes. Can you confirm? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Anto Budiarjo. I'm going to be uh, presenting some, some work that we've been doing the last few years. By way of introduction, uh, I have been uh, developing integration platforms for building systems, uh, which is really IoT, for uh, about 30 years. So I have a lot of experiences in, in trying to bring systems together at that level. Um, and this work of uh, CNSCP, uh, also known as Connection Profile, came out uh, out of work that uh, we've been doing the last few years in developing um, a, an integration platform uh, in the internet era, as it were. So uh, we came up uh, with, with this mechanism and it became clear um, to us as we started to think about de uh, deploying it and implementing it that it should be something that is put in the public domain. So we are in the process of doing that, making um, connection profiles um, open, and we can speak a little bit more about that. So um, uh, one of the things that we've been doing the last couple of years is um, testing out this, this mechanism within the digital twin com um, uh, consortium community, essentially sort of incubating this idea. And it's very, been a very, uh, very interesting um, experience there testing it out with a number of um, uh, really sort of different use cases that we may be able to talk about towards the end. So the way um, we have um, thought about th um, thinking about the, the, this, this problem is really from a system of systems perspective. Um, uh, and um, the DTC, the Digital Twin Consortium is actually in the process of writing a paper on digital uh, system or systems. Um, uh, I'm uh, one of the authors of that. And so the, the, what's sort of interesting to us is that when we started to think about system of systems as a way of making um, systems in, uh, be able to interoperate with each other in a, in a digital twin, um, one of the interesting motivations was this um, paper that was um, released in 2010 from IBM that basically said that the, the global economy, the 100% of the GDP of the world is um, actually a system of systems but we're not thinking or running it as a system of systems. And it is um, quite a sort of economic um, paper. And they basically said that this is costing us $4 trillion back in 2010. So it's about 10% of the world GDP. So it's a big problem. Um, and obviously there's a value in trying to figure it out. Um, so the way we started to think about it is that because the world economy is, you know, by definition, extremely complex, I, I was trying to simplify um, what system a system is, and I uh, came back to um, uh, nature and thinking about flock of birds, because a flock of birds is clearly a system of systems. There are two types of entities here, a flock and a birds. They obviously organize, which is a flock, which is a system, and the birds um, as, um, as animals are systems. 
So when we um, dig into this and start to understand how does a flock of birds work, how do they know how to do this, and they do this um, over and over again, um, the, the thing that became sort of interesting is really the relationships. And the only relationship that really exists in a flock of birds is relationships between one bird and another. You know, one bird can know that it's following another bird um, and um, so on and so forth. Um, all of the birds have some kind of um, uh, mechanism like this, and that is essentially what makes the flock. There's nothing else. There's no, there's no um, uh, uh, other entity that's actually forcing the, the 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 birds to fly in that way. It's actually the, themselves. So we try to uh, then take that to a sort of systems discussion, and this is the the the, the, the way we decided to depict that. We have essentially a system of systems that is, that's depicted um, by the gears that you see here that is made up of these constituent systems um, that are uh, essentially uh, you know, equipment and other things and IoT and digital twin. Um, but we already know from the flock of birds that the gears aren't really there. So they're sort of invisible gears. Um, and what you're left with is a whole bunch of um, um, nodes um, which we refer to as um, interface nodes. So think about the interface nodes as the brains of the birds and the, the equipment here as the body of the birds. The brain of the birds knows about things. It knows about the system of systems. It knows what's around it. And it also knows about itself. It knows about its health, et cetera. And once we start thinking about it this way, then each node becomes unique. And once uh, each node becomes unique, we start to be able to think about relationships between um, uh, two entities, two, two birds, as it were. So L and K are two entities. And this is really the relationship that we uh, see as being valuable. And connection profile is a mechanism to model um, the behavior of that relationship or the contents of that relationship. And that's really the, the premise of uh, connection profiles. Um, the way connection profile works is that the, 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 the Constituent systems, the client systems, and the server system, there's always a client and a server in a connection profile mechanism. They instantiate themselves into the system of systems um, and creating these sort of uh, virtual nodes. So you have the two virtual nodes. As part of that instantiation, they, they provide information such as the context of where, uh, what they're interested in. Uh, if you think of the birds as that particular um, flock of birds as, as opposed to the one that's um, five kilometers south of it. And um, the, the the mechanism then uh, asks the, the systems to declare what is this able to do in terms of connection profiles. Connection profiles all have names. So uh, this the, the example here is proto.example.sys. Uh, all the profiles are uh, given names like, such as that. So what this client is saying is that it can consume this profile and the server says that it can serve that profile in this particular context. So that's kind of the premise of, of um, uh, what needs to happen. What the system of systems does as a broker, it looks at that and it says, okay, there are two compatible um, complementary uh, connection profile declarations in a particular context. So what it then does is it goes and looks up the connection profile model of proto.example.sys, and it creates an instance of that at the context uh, in question. And from that point on, metadata flows between the, the, the client, the virtual client and the virtual um, server. And the definition of the what metadata, what metadata flows is exactly what is in the connection profile itself that I'll explain in a second. So uh, we think about this as metadata. So we think about this as a control plane of, um, of this whole system. Um, in many cases, uh, in most cases, in fact, in IoT and Digital Twin, there's a, the, the systems themselves have some kind of uh, protocol and some kind of need to communicate direct, uh, directly with each other. So connection profile mechanism allows this to happen. Um, and with um, the metadata potentially being communication parameters that will inform how this uh, data flows directly between the client and the server. Uh, so this is the simple, the, 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 the mechanism itself in the simplest uh, uh, form. The other way to think about this is um, when it's not a digital twin, um, the, the mechanism is the same, everything above is the same. The, the, the difference here is that the connection instance, then we can think about that as passing data rather than metadata. <clears throat> right? So both applies and the, the mechanism uh, is the same for both. 
The connection profile itself, uh, this is an example of one. Uh, it's actually pretty simple. This is header information. This is the name. Uh, as I said, all of the names have this sort of form similar to domain name uh, form, but it's not domain names at all. Um, so header information, the most important part of this is the, um, the, uh, the stuff on the right here, hand side, because this describes what type of server this connection profile was uh, created for and what type of client on what type of application, what type, what type of purpose. Um, so a connection profile you can think of as a, uh, as a codification of a use case of why two systems need to communicate to do something. And the payload of connection profile are these what we call properties. And the properties are tagged either as being properties that come from the server or from the client. And these properties need to be filled in at instantiation, not at the model stage. So um, here there are a number of properties, URI, prod, cost. Uh, so it, they can be any type of property that, that makes sense for that particular application that's defined in the, in the header. And the client um, also has to provide um, um, some, some um, properties as, uh, as per the use case. Um, so this is this is the the simple nature of the connection profile. Connection profile sits in a broader thing called the connectivity naming system, which is first of all it's made up of connection profiles themselves, um, obviously a whole bunch of them, um, and um, the, the 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 full picture of the connection profile is that there is a then a connection profile registry where all the connection profiles are put into. Um, uh, it's somewhat similar again there's uh, some sort of analogy to DNS so think about this as being very similar to how DNS um, uh, servers work uh, we then have the client nodes and the server nodes these are applications they're representing applications as per my previous slides they have interfaces to the to the um, uh, uh, registry and then you have the broker and specific interfaces uh, with client and server nodes um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, this is really the, the open source sort of mechanisms and licenses um, that we think is appropriate for the different components. And all of this is done for um, uh, innovation to happen either on the client or on the uh, server end or on the orchestrator itself. And obviously this is where we work. So um, it's, we, we think it's a very um, uh, useful mechanism to make um, uh, things connect with each other. So um, philosophically, um, this is really what's going on here. Uh, we believe that we currently live in what we describe as an endpoint centric world. And so that if you take a diagram such as this, that we see all the time, um, all over the place, what we do is we think about the nodes. We think about the endpoints, uh, because the endpoints are where computing is, is where application is, where data is, where people is, where things are, right? Everything that we as humans do typically is, is a node. When we draw lines between them, we really think about them as communication between endpoints, 5G, uh, Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way we think at the moment. Uh, we, we think there's a better way of thinking about this. And we call this a relationship-centric uh, view of it, where the endpoints are the same endpoints we had before. Nothing has changed there. Um, the, the difference is that the, the, the relations, the lines then become relationships. And what we're re really proposing is that we should really be managing and thinking about those relationships because that's really where the value is. I think we all know that data, uh, static data, if it just stays there forever, is actually no use. Data is useful when it gets used and when it's transferred from one system to another. So um, the, 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 uh, the, the thesis here is that we should really be managing that and sort of um, uh, extracting the most out of that. So um, as a way of explaining what this, uh, what this means, if we think of the endpoint centric world that we live in, if we have two pieces of equipment, two systems of, of, of any sort, right, and there's data in, in both that from an application perspective, we need to move between one and the other. What we have to do today is we have to have a whole bunch of other um, parameters and metadata and other information to enable that data to go from one side to the other. Uh, everything from the URI of the server to keys and certs and um, all sorts of business rules and stuff like that, that we need to have on both sides. And they need to synchronize and they, they need to match uh, before data can actually flow. Uh, and really, the, the only way that we have to do that um, is two main ways. 
Uh, one is through the very comms pipe that we want to put the data in, right? So we're using the comms pipe to control the comms pipe, which is kind of not really um, a, a good way to think about that. So that's the main uh, the way of uh, we're doing it. And for really, really critical information, we resort to ourselves, human, sneaker net. Uh, so thinking about things like API keys, the way we do that is we email them or copy and paste them to, with each other. So this is the way that we have to um, synchronize this. Um, we think this is very, very expensive, all of this. Very expensive, very risky, and it's actually creating a lot more uh, issues than um, they solve. Uh, but it's the way we do things at the moment. So that's the first challenge, is that the synchronizing everything is, is, is hard. The, the other uh, challenge um, is that this um, picture here of, of, the, the, of, of the network, as it were, is not normalized. Right, nothing is normalized here. When you when you look at the sort of the the, the abstract view, uh, sure there are APIs that are normalized and there are IP packets going back and forth, but you you can't tell what this line is, for example, across these two nodes because it really depends on the actual application. There's there's very little little normalization, and that's really what's creating um, uh, this uh, this complex world that we live in. Um, as we move to relationships. Relationships are also complex in a different way. And here we, we think about humans. When, when we have relationships, there are different layers of um, the aspects between, between two humans, right? We have uh, trustworthiness, right? So somebody would have a set um, of trustworthiness. Um, Carsten, for example, I know that he's a member of IETF and RTF. So when we started to communicate, I know who he is and he knew who I was. Uh, through other sort of mechanisms. We also have other uh, ways of um, determining our trustworthiness. And um, when, we need, when, two P, when two individuals or two systems need to communicate, that then creates a level of trust between them. Um, and that basically says it's okay to have this relationship. Um, then there are the issues of capabilities. Um, Carsten have a certain uh, set of capabilities, and so do I. And when they, they when they match each other, there's compatibility. So there's some usefulness in uh, relationship between the two. And then there's a state, which is the current state of the, the two entities. Um, the current state of, of, of Carsten is as he was presenting it in, in the opening in terms of explaining this, this work group, etc. And I have this similar thing. And there is a context that defines that there is some usefulness in actually us having a conversation and lastly we're actually having a conversation right so this works in in human uh, sort of world the the premise here is why shouldn't it work in systems and so the way we think about uh, how to make that work is that if we go back to the same use case that we had before um, we still have um, for now anyway all of the parameters that's needed but what we're proposing is all of those can be put into one or more uh, connection profiles uh, one, for example, for trust, which is one of the use cases that we, we have done a lot of work in, in uh, the DTC. And there's also a white paper coming out on that. So we can have an, uh, any number of connection profiles. And again, if there is a need for data to go directly, then a comms pipe um, could, could also be implemented here. And what this does is it normalizes everything because the, the, the picture on the top is normalized using CNS because I now know that this line here is made up of some CNS connections of a certain uh, connection profile, name connection profiles, it's all model. And each of the connection profiles um, is then uh, modeled so that you, it's predictable, it's normalized, uh, de depending on the needs and the applications involved. Um, and the whole thing is dynamic and, and composable. Right, so we could, we've gone from a completely un, unnormalized world into a very normalized world. So that's kind of the, the, the what we think is the proper value proposition of um, this technology. Um, get into some tactical level. How does this work? If we imagine a connection profile called test.abc, where the client is obligated to provide two properties and the service provided um, two different properties. When the, the client starts up, it does a registration. It publishes itself to the orchestrator, to the broker, um, with, its, with a node ID, with the context that it's interested in, the connection profile that it's able to, um, to do, and the roles, in this case, the client, and the properties, Foo1 and Foo2. It sends all of that to the broker. The broker says, thank you very much. I've I, know, I now know what you want and what matches I'm looking for. 
um, and have a nice day. That's kind of it. Uh, sometime later, a millisecond later or a year later, the orchestrator, the broker finds a match and it basically starts a flow of um, what we're thinking of as a subscription because it's basically connected, it's sent to the client the information about the, the, the match, which is obviously a server um, with those properties far one and far two. And from here on in, there is a an ongoing bi-directional flow of information, one going from the client to the server and another one going from the server to the client simultaneously. So that's how the, the mechanism works. Um, put into sort of JSON um, a way of thinking about it, this is the same flow. This will be a, a publishing um, a packet. Um, manifest and this will be what comes back. Um, here is the, the the node ID and this is the connection, etc. And ongoing beyond that, it's just the values flowing back and forth. Um, just sort of zoom out a little bit, and uh, it is just sort of how it, how this works. If you think of an environment where there are two different contexts, you can think of this as a factory with a manufacturing plant and an admin plant, let's say. Um, when a system instantiates itself, it says, here's me, I'm system one, I can do these four things, these four connection profiles, A, B, C, and D, um, A as a server and the others as a, as a client. Um, right now, there's nothing else in the, system, in, the, in the environment, so it's not connected to anything. Um, then system two comes along, it actually bridges between context one and context two, which is fine. There's a matching A, all right? So that gets connected, so that's good, and there's really nothing else. Um, one interesting thing to note in, in terms of the composability of all of this is that both system one and system two are clients to a some kind of trust connection profile, which is telling me that both systems understand a way of using that trust connection profile as a way to determine whether their connections are trustworthy. And the, the, these two clients are not satisfied right now because there is no trust server in, this, in the environment right now. So there is no trust relationship between system one and system two. And what is interesting is that can then inform what data flows in this A link that actually the connection profile actually knows nothing about the trust, but the system one and system two does. Until sometime later, some system X comes along with a, with a trust server. And then at that point, a system one and system two would have some familiarity of the trust that they each have. And so that can actually change the, the nature of this connection. Um, and, and obviously it's dynamic. So if a system X goes away, it can actually go back to that state. So you can then go on and there are obviously other lines here that we can, we can explore later. So this is kind of the interesting thing about connection profile. It creates this dynamic uh, uh, network. I'm starting to think about this as a network. Lastly, um, this is really, uh, it's got a big question mark on it. We're trying to sort of figure out how this fit in, fits in with a with a seven layer stack. We think it's somewhere like that, um, but we're not sure. Um, and uh, would love to get feedback or, you know, I think that's some, some work that needs to be done. So that's, that's um, uh, basically my presentation. Okay, thank you, Anto. Uh, the the agenda has a second presentation from Toby. We don't have slides for that. Toby, he's on he's on the call and um, yeah, okay. He just uh, is okay. asking for screen sharing. So we are ready. A bit over time, ten minutes over time. Uh, we can, of course, eat into the discussion, and maybe I can also make the energy uh, part uh, shorter. So uh, I think we do have. So, so I time. don't know if I'm successfully sharing at this time because when I put it up, I just see an, a hall of mirrors, and when I don't put it up, well, I just see my presentation. So, so given my ignorance of this particular platform, am I sharing a screen now? I don't see it. Okay, so, let me so you, you are exercising the screen sharing mechanics. <laughs> Good for that. <laughs> A window, okay. Uh, <laughs> and yet I have this up. Why is it not showing up? Are you trying the, uh, the icon the second from the left, at the top left? 
that says ask to share slides? Yeah, that, that that's all active. Uh, but for some reason, his computer is not actually sharing. Um, uh -huh. Ah, there, oh, there it we is. Go. Okay, good, 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 good. So, so first, I, I'm going to tell you who I am because you know, you take anything from anybody unless you know who they are. Um, my name is Toby Constein. I've been working with standards having to do with the Internet of Things for more than 20 years. Uh, before that, I spent a good 15 years integrating every kind of control system that you can imagine. Um, building systems, uh, transmission systems, distribution systems, uh, large fluidized bed coal plant cogeneration systems, thermal storage systems. And just to make it more fun, all of this was on a... Uh, a U.S. state university, which means every building was a low bid government contract, which means nothing talked to anything else. There's no standards about what the systems were in there. So that made me focus very much on issues of uh, integration and other stuff. Before I could do anything else, I want to talk some about having done standards for years. I want to say a couple things about what good standards are. I think anybody who's on this card call knows this, but I think it's worth saying aloud anyway. So good standards are stable. You don't want to have a big complex standard that changes all the time when every time something new comes. Uh, they have to be visible. People have to know how to use them and see them and build their own value on them. They need to be modular because instead of, of, of changing things, getting new versions of the standard once a week, you want to be able to stick a new thing in. And um, so to me, the, 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 we all use mail every day, which is just this pile of standards. Um, the calendar comes in as just another standard in the stack. We mix and match. If someone's using plain text instead of HTML, our mail handles it. Uh, a few years back, people were using RTF instead of HTML. Standards just handle it. You, you, so you want modular standards that can compose and adjust as time changes. And that's very much my way of thinking about this stuff and how this works. Um, Complex standards are, are hard to implement, can be use more tools to make, they can to be more extensive. And I want simple standards that are that that you can ease and easily use and redeploy and put in new purposes, including purposes that whoever wrote the standard never thought of. Now, one of the things I said ahead of time was if you guys like this sort of a, a early draft of something that might be a standards track RFC, but it's, it needs more work. But I shared it early, and I don't know whether that was shared with anybody else other than Karsten when I mailed it out. But we can talk about that later. And so I said I would talk about more detailed things. I was partly assuming I was going to be talking about that too. Um, so as I said, 25 years of integrating BIS. I was a significant author of the US National Smart Grid Roadmap which is a system of systems, it properly done. The attempts to make it be a single system are all gonna fail badly. Um, I've got multiple specifications under my belt already. OBIX, which is a internationally used standard for talking to control, embedded control systems. WS Calendar, which is a machine to machine schedule negotiation, which is an important for twins and other things, but it's adapted for machine to machine negotiation, but it's also semantically um, identical to the whole iCalendar family of IATF standards. As part of doing that, I was with a team that updated all the iCalendar standards in the last decade or so. I don't know if you've been tracking them as a group, but there's a new iCalendar, there's a new, um, there's a new uh, V card, there's a new, um, free to busy, there's, there's an entirely new standard availability, which is very important for, for um, digital twin kind of stuff. Availability is, oh, this is available during business hours. Oh, but what are business hours for you? So it's, it's, it's repeating patterns over time of, of schedule negotiations. Um, within Smart Energy, um, as the editor of the Energy Market Information Exchange, which is used and was, has appeared in IEEE standards, energy interoperation of which open ADR, which is a demand response in buildings is a standard. That was a decade ago. I wish it was lighter and looser than it was, but 
now there's an installed base that's hired to clean it up. There's now com common transactive services coming out, which is very much lighter and looser profiles of those standards. I'm working with the spatial web, which is similar to the digital twin efforts. It's the idea that we should put um, AR and AI and VR as, as primary activities in the web and also have it fully distributed. Right now, we've fallen into a war, walled garden mode that we got out of when the, you know, when the internet came in in a big way. And I was working with the internet before this stuff came out and with BitNet before that. But there was a while where everyone went to walled gardens, to AOL, to CompuServe, to bulletin boards. And then they got open, you could go everywhere. And then we've all fallen back to, oh, but the entire internet lives in seven data centers worldwide, which is a bad scenario for lots of things. So part of the goal of spatial web is how do we make it entirely decentralized again, including decentralized identifiers, um, how can I establish an identity for this context in this place without going back and having my identity checked out from a central repository that knows where I'm going and using it? So there's a whole bunch of standards in that effort, which I may talk about later. And I've been working with Anto on connection profiles, trying to get that developed, um, trying to get that um, moved up to a point where it's light and loose and easy to use for, for multiple purposes. I also work with the... Um, that started the Energy Mashup Lab, which is whose purpose is free open source software, Apache 2 license for fractal microgrid operation based on transactive energy. I can take questions on that if there is any, but now I'm done talking about me. Um, so I want to talk for a minute about the challenge of the Internet of Things, which includes digital twins, which is one, it's much more diverse than typical IT. Um, there are more types of things. I mean, at some level, Everything in typical IT is everything that was in a Novell network. You know, there's a database server and a file server and a web server and clients and find the protocols have changed, but that's pretty simple framework. Uh, but you get into things, you have every kind of air conditioner, every kind of, of extruder, every kind of factory, every kind of, there's just more types of things. They're also longer lived, which leads to its own kind of diversity whole enterprise systems come and go while well, one air conditioning system lives on in the building. Um, and that increases diversity even with a product line and brand line, because of course, now I might simultaneously be talking to the 20 year old version of something and the 15 year old version of something and the 10 year old version of something and the brand new version of something. So that's another whole class of diversity that, that you get in the internet of things. Cyber physical security is ill-defined at best most people um and you know i i could i could be hacking a, a autonomous car by having an led flashlight on the side of the road and hitting the sensors in the right way i could be hacking an air a heating and cooling system by taking a little lighter and hanging it up holding it under the thermostat i could be so so the i could be destroying battery systems by hitting them with a a rather simple to make over the weekend ultrasound generator that would that would ping the battery and cause it to start overheating in interesting ways that the control system of that battery doesn't understand. So the cyber physical profile, cybersecurity profile is much, much more complex than in traditional IT. Um, system configuration often requires deep domain knowledge and a lot of early attempts at doing the Internet of Things came result of people who thought they understood something because they were always the smartest guy in the room, but they didn't understand that other people studied what they were doing for a long time. And to me, with my smart grid background, one of my favorite examples of that is the, um, the disease that we now call Legionnaire's disease. The reason it's called Legionnaire's disease is the utility guys who are the smartest because they're electrical engineers told a hotel how to save energy in the wake of the uh, 1973 uh, energy price shocks. And they told them, oh, you don't need to run the fans after a cooling cycle is over. That's just wasting energy. Well, they didn't understand we, that that was we, actually... We are now really running out of time. Okay, I'll go faster. So, so anyway, can go fast forward to the slides that actually are about digital twins. 
Okay, so let's, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, um, I didn't anticipate so much intro at the beginning of all this. So the, 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 the things I'm trying to do is, is to have abstract interface to break up span of control, to isolate diversity and encapsulate it, to let system experts publish interfaces, which is the heart of our proposal on connection on the CNSCP system, to empower developers. Uh, this slide right here shows that the cyber physical security challenge and it's not quite clear who that surface, that published surface is securing. Is it securing the crocodiles? Is it securing the researcher who's hiding under the crocodile um, mask? Because the server can be hacking the client just as the client can be hacking the server. It's just the internet of things and digital twins is a much more complex environment. So those are, those I think are the challenges of digital twins and the standards that I published and shared and sent to you everything. Um, so the pro boost, oh, look, I misspelled my slides. The pro CNSCP specification enables anyone to publish interfaces and then creates a universal registry. The goal of that is to think, so maybe I'm a company that's making a piece of equipment. I can publish what a connection looks like. Maybe I'm an integrator who does some special thing. I can publish what my interface looks like. I can and all of those are universally available, like DNS, you know, the, the actual lookups are public, but the use of them is private, like DNS. So it's, um, this is all designed to be a way to compose cybersecurity, uh, application gateways, line protocols, and semantic overlays easily and simply. Um, we have defined a model of connection brokers to create what's essentially a control plane of services for the Internet of Things to enable edge-based interactions without central uh, queries and without central authorization, to enable advanced logging and forensics. And to me, one of the most important things is that the state of the broker becomes a long-term state for maintainability. If somebody takes a, an old service away and replaces it with a brand new version, you have broken connections. Those broken connections tell you what needs to be replaced. I was doing significant enterprise interactions between Internet of Things and building control systems back in the early 90s. And they were wonderful. And they were almost never maintained because when something changed, nobody could tell what happened. So to me, one of the big exciting things about the CNS CP system is that it, it, it intrinsically provides documentation of the decisions you made about connections already. I want to talk about this one just a little bit. It's very easy to focus on connection profiles here, that this thing is connecting to that, is exposing that, this is connecting that, and there's a one-to-one -one connection. But this node here is potentially more interesting. So this node's connected to two. Is it adding that one together or having a voting system? before it exposes to something else, before it exposes to something else? Can you build a framework of connectivity and knowledge and actors within a CNSCP system to, to bring different connections from different places and to do new meta information that's got new value? And I believe you should be able to compose this. And I think we, we've got a proposal here today that enables you to do that. So it's easy to, when describing it, it's easy to focus on this connection down here. But this connection going to that, where it's translated and distributed to that, where it comes in as one of the three voting aspects that goes into that, before it comes to that, that is actually a more interesting fabric in many ways. Because that's where you get additional value from the network, from the intentionality of the network, and from how it's applied. So I think whatever we do we need to enable the capability of the network talking to the network being an additional new source of value um i think cncscp which i sent out to the group before but again i don't know if it's distributed um as a seed standard for other efforts that are trying to do it digital twins has been mentioned clearly since we've been working with the digital twin consortium for some time we're already embedded in them but say P2874 and the IEEE is talking about trying to build distributed meshes of devices and Internet of Things. They want to every device and thing to share geolocation and be amenable to virtual reality depictions. 
to be ready to be analyzed by artificial intelligence, machine learning, and even have augmented reality where information coming out of the VR and the AI ML and the geolocation comes out into what you might see as you walk through it and do it all in a decentralized wet manner. They see the same connection profile as kind of a seed standard, one of the ones, one of the tools that they use to wire this up. So, so we are, I think we've got a light loose standard in that way right now that I proposed and sent to the group before that works just like that is one of the pieces to connect more interesting applications together. So um, I think it gives you an idea of what we're thinking about and what the, what the pieces are. I gave these slides to Carson in advance, which means he can distribute them. I have some references on the work that follow because I do that after discussion. Nobody wants to see them, but sometimes people want to look up what I was talking about. And with that, I welcome any questions or comments. Over. Thank you. So I think we, we still have a couple of minutes to, to get uh, clarifying questions out. So anybody who has a question, please raise your hand. <clears throat> Okay. Carry Carry in. In. Good. Are you still on mute, Carrie? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear my name. Uh, I, I have actually two questions. Uh, the first, when it comes to discoverability, um, I would be curious to know why you have a DNS-like system but just didn't adopt DNS. Uh, secondly, is the intention here ultimately that uh, these connections are composed without human intervention? So, for example, in the case where there might be more than one provider for um, some, some information, how does the system decide which of those sources it might use? So, so, so I, I can, let, let, me, let me answer that. The, the, on, the first, on the first point about DNS, uh, we, did, we did think about that. Um, there is one really very subtle difference between this and DNS. DNS is really about um, dis discovering information in real time. I go to CNN and DNS converts it to an IP somewhere along the line, right? And that IP chain can actually change and there are different components of the DNS record that changes all the time. Uh, a connection profile never changes, is immutable forever because it doesn't describe how you get to something, it describes um, the, the function or the, the information um, of, of a connection between two entities, between client and server. And the intent is that becomes a specification that never changes. So going to Toby's comment that once you install something, 20 years later, you could still uh, rely on that connection profile to mean the same thing as it was uh, 20 years previous. So that's, it also that's, has a much more diversity of information than DNS is. I mean, DNS is used for all kinds of things, but but essentially, once you get the name, which is very DNS-like, you have any number of name value pairs, some of which are associated with the client and some with the server profile. If it's three I, name value pairs, I can figure out how to stuff it in DNS. If it's 50, maybe DNS doesn't fit properly. There might be a way to do it, but as of yet, it's not clear to me. I welcome suggestions on how to do it entirely with DNS. I love the things that have been done with DNS, like real-time blacklisting and things like that, where they've taken code, they've taken functionality already available, they've taken stuff that's already been hardened for cybersecurity and repurposed it for a different use. Well, there's actually but a so whole far, I just I, haven't figured out how to do it. There's there's actually a whole I, IETF working group called DNS Service Discovery, which is um, aimed at precisely this. Um, so the second question about composability of connections, are you proposing to do this without human intervention or not, not clear to me? But the, 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 the ultimate, the, the creation of each connection, the answer is yes. Um, but really in, in practice, what happens is that that, that connection um, or the, those connections or connections occur um, 
after somebody or following somebody does something manually. In other words, I install a piece of equipment in, in, a, in a factory and then I install it in the system that is the orchestrator um, managing that factory. And that then triggers the discovery mechanism that is done by the, the system or systems or the broker that then starts to create the, the connection. So indirectly, it is human triggered in most cases, but the, the actual nature of it is, is not. Let's 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 to explore that. Let's take a very simple, almost trivially simple um, um, connection type: ambient room temperature. It's only one value. It's one way, but maybe I want to know it. I might have a complex enterprise HVAC system, which can tell me that for every room in the building. I expose those each with a context. The context might be a room number or something else. There has to be some semantic standard that is developed within a corporation to apply to that profile. And then I can say, look, I've got all these room temperatures that I could expose to you. Well, so the connections are created to this guy, to this system that wants to consume ambient room temperatures. As, as all these, these connections are there, but maybe it says, I only want to see the law. I only care about the lobby. I'm not going to actually wire anything else to use it. So then the connections are there, but unused. The system has discovered them and said, you could use any of these. It shares the context so they can be used. But, but whether anybody wants to use them, finds any value in using them, that's another thing. So connections have a life cycle between when they've been discovered versus when somebody says, now I want to use them, to when someone says, now I'm not going to use them anymore. So, and and mm -hmm. we can imagine this profile being built into things out of the box in the future and connection brokers. So we have this notion of connection brokers, which is a private thing. Connections themselves in the system are, are universally available and known worldwide, but a broker might be private, might have any kind of security decisions. I don't necessarily want to expose to my competitor the details of connections that I have in my internal broker. So you have these different realms of security for different things. And that's outlined in the the kind of early draft of the RFC I just I, I set out. But it it also speaks somewhat to your, your question, Kerry. Have, is, have you got your answer? Yes, thank you. Okay. So Jan Holler is next on the queue. Jan, are you saying something? We don't hear you. Maybe he's muted. Well, he's oh. not on my screen. Hmm. Well, we are oh, doing some noises, Jan, but not voice. So. Can you can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. It showed that I was unmuted, or yeah, uh, that I was unmuted. Um, um, but anyway, well, I, ha I have a question for my understanding, and that is, um, for your for your two presentations, is is this something that uh, is being worked on inside the uh, DTC? as some sort of agreed best practices on way forward? Or how, how, how do I interpret what, what you just uh, presented from, from a DTC perspective? So the, 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 the answer to that is um, no, it is not um, an official mechanism or technology that is being adopted by the DTC. Um, and primarily because that's not what the DTC is, is created to do. The DTC is really to, um, created to understand the broader picture of uh, digital twins and explore use cases and explore how to uh, make digital twins work. Uh, and so what the, the way I describe what we've been doing in DTC is actually incubating the connection profile mechanism um, by um, exploring um, probably about half a dozen to a dozen different use cases over the um, year, 18 months uh, that we've been doing that within the DTC. So a lot of the thinking um, that I, I, I shared sort of came out out of that, that work, um, but not as a, it's not formally um, a, a, an entity of, um, uh, of the Digital Twin Consortium. 
okay thanks and then the follow-on question to that is uh if the topic of interoperability uh, how that is being discussed in dtc in context of that there might be you know different practices in how you deploy deploy solutions for for specific use cases yeah so th there's a paper that i co-authored um uh, called the um, system interoperability framework um which really um explored what needed to be considered when you think about interoperability at the system level between systems and obviously with a with a digital mind a digital twin um, sort of uh, frame uh, uh, perspective um, and and that that led to this paper that I mentioned earlier um, on the system of systems and uh, really the, the 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 link there is that we think once you have a whole bunch of systems that we actually that you actually want to interoperate with each other the way the best way to think about that is a system of systems because in a system of systems um, um, environment the, com the the constituent systems that make up the system of systems they have to uh, interact with each other in an interoperable way so that's kind of um, how i would link the interoperability um, uh, topic with um, digital twin and, and system of systems. I, I hope that clarifies things. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I don't know, we are over time, but I, I could have, I could pop one more question. Um, and that is related to uh, uh, data and information models, data, data and information models and ontologies, etc. Looking at some other standards work that, for instance, Etsy is doing around context information management and smart applications, reference ontology, etc uh and also the work that is being done in iso iec around asset admin shells that are mm -hmm. you know industry 4.0 digital twins how does yeah, that come, in, we, come does that come into the picture i mean uh, I, yeah. I, I missed a bit the the, the, in, the input or the discussion around uh around the uh, data models and, and ontologies actually yeah A A aas uh, came in quite often in the dtc discussions um and the the way we sort of think about connection profile the, the unique difference of connection profiles is that it knows about both ends simultaneously uh, aas is not about that aas is defining what a a, a, a thing is by create uh, by defining it as a shell um, the connection profile is focused on how two things talk to each other and therefore defining the information that's needed from both ends at the same time. Um, and that's that's really what this thing is modeling. It's modeling a relationship between things. Um, I, I think um, um, as far as we are aware, all of the other sort of ways of modeling things is actually modeling a thing, not modeling a relationship. That That is the key difference here. So, okay, so you. there's been side questions coming to me through the uh, through the um, meet echo, meet techo, whatever it is, about definitions of digital twins and how they work. And the question is, that's such a wide topic because digital twin means so many different things to so many people. Some people believe that it's a three dimensional digital complete representation of every single thing completely, and you need that for some things. Some people believe that it's a, uh, a complete record of every nut and bolt that was put into a complex facility or was constructed. It's static, but, but that way if somebody kinds of bolt rusts, you know every place where that bolt needs to be replaced. That's one definition. Others are saying, I just need these five facts so I can model them in my simulation and compare them. So there's a lot of, in any conversation about digital twins, and how it works, the first follow-on question must be, what do digital twins mean to you? Because it's all over the map. Yeah. Um, and and I also have a request for a link to Anto's paper. Anto, can you send that to, to, I guess, Karsten afterwards and he can share it with the group? Or do yep. you have a link you can post in the chat now? Yeah. You can, uh, uh, thanks you thanks for the answer. I, I agree. I agree on, on the, uh, that, you know, it, it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, there are multiple <laughs> interpretations, unfortunately. But thanks. You can easily add documents to the GitHub repository by making a pull request. Uh, so okay. That's the standard way of putting in stuff there. 
Good. So um, we are at uh, 1350 world time or 1550 um, the time where I'm sitting. And I'm going to try to, to <laughs> get back some of the uh, time by doing the next two segments pretty quickly. Um, I, I have minus one minute. I won't quite make that. Um, so one thing I wanted to, to talk about uh, quickly is uh, the activity in the network management research group to apply the concept of a digital twins twin to networks. And as I said, we, we didn't get uh, someone who, who actually represents this research group because they, they had a big uh, workshop last week and we didn't quite pull this off. Um, so basically, they, they are thinking about a network as, as something that is worth having a digital twin of uh, for, for a number of reasons. And uh, they, they define this as something that has data, both historical and real time, that has models, which allow you to find out what's, what uh, something should be doing, uh, what something will be doing, and maybe what something is doing in a different way than you thought. So maybe it's doing it wrong. And of course, it's a number of interfaces between the network and the digital twin and being the, between the digital twin and the uh, applications. And they are looking at this from a network management point of view. So they, they really want to analyze what's going on, diagnose deviations that they're experiencing. They actually want to be able to decouple the digital twin for a moment and run it as an emulation system to see what happens if I uh, do this to my network, if I switch off that link uh, or something like that. And then finally to control the physical network by actually operating um, uh, the digital twin and having that synchronized with a, a real uh, network. And uh, that of course requires some mac mapping uh, mechanism uh, and uh, it also might require some coupling mechanisms because the, the twins actually might be replicated as well. So that you need some way to uh, uh, forward data from one digital twin to a different digital twin. So this is uh, obvious an evolution of, of the old idea of, of having management agents um, in, in um, uh, network elements where you obtain data from and put into a management station that, that knows what that, that uh, network element is actually uh, doing. And this is adding a lot of uh, granularity to that. So right now, they, what they have is essentially an architecture um, document that, that contains this uh, picture here. So we, we have a physical network, which is one uh, part of the twin and we have an instance of the digital twin network and that uh, uses data collection from the physical network uh, plus a control interface to the uh, physical network and in that instance we have various things going on which in turn talk to applications that want to do certain things uh, visualize aid with diagnosis um, or use the emulation capabilities to to actually uh, see what would happen if, if some control uh, operation uh, were performed. Toby, very quick question. I, I just want to observe that this is actually at the heart of, of efforts at, um, at service-oriented uh, cybersecurity right now, uh, keeping twins running, having them in full emulation, knowing that the relationship that things have are complex and we don't know, we can't look necessarily for one particular thing happening to hack them, but we can notice that somehow they're being dragged out of the right performance, out of alignment with the emulation. So this is a, a key cybersecurity feature that's that's going on in some of the groups I'm meeting with. Like we're... Okay, so that, that was my two minute uh, presentation of, of what the network management research group is um, up to. Now I quickly want to talk about SDF because that, that's actually an, a data and interaction modeling uh, activity uh, that uh, has been going on uh, for a while and uh, which will be made use of in the next uh, two 
uh, talks, so I, I must admit I didn't massage my slides a lot here, but uh, I think we can, can still use them. Um, so basically, the SDF was created out of the need for one data model, and one data model actually is an organization that is not related to the IETF, but that, that just consisted of people who were coming together from various ecosystem uh, standards development organizations and uh, wanted to make sure their data models are harmonized uh, in some way, because you, you don't really make your money from from having great data models you have make your money from from having your devices interact uh, great with the devices which actually may be from a different ecosystem um, and so of course uh, the the idea is not to to have an n by m problem so you have uh, to 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 uh, translate uh, between tens of ecosystems uh, and have individual translators but to have something that is in the middle and can be uh, used as a hub to get these data models together. And the data models actually are lots because there, there simply are lots of different things that, that you want to make smart, that you want to provide uh, interfaces with. And uh, so <clears throat> there are already uh, some, some 200 data models in the repository of uh, one data model. So that, that's the, the basic idea. And they quickly noticed they not only need those models, they actually need a common format uh, to define these uh, models uh, in. So th th there are very different terminologies, very different ways of defining data models in the contributing uh, SDOs uh, in the different ecosystems. Uh, so it, it makes sense to talk about a common format uh, first. And uh, the, the interesting thing, what happened was that 1DM decided they really want to work on the data models. So the, the uh, definition format discussions were outsourced to the IETF. And that's great because the IETF is, is very good in um, solving limited, well-defined problems, which is essentially what we got from, from 1DM. And there is now a working group called ASDF that is preferring this uh, semantic definition format uh, specification. So um, this defines classes of things. And while things might have some, some data internally, what really defines them is their interactions uh, with their peers in the digital world, which might be a digital twin, but it might also be, be something very uh, different. So if a light talks to a light switch, that's one of the interactions we want to uh, model here. And we do this by borrowing terms from, from the uh, uh, human computer interaction world, uh, where uh, computers or computer based systems have affordances, which are the, the knobs and, and uh, uh, sliders and so on that can be used to do something with the uh, uh, physical item. And the physical item reacts uh, to that by, by actually implementing these affordances. And we have three big interaction patterns here, property, action, and event. I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. And finally, we do have some common data structures. So if you have an RGB lamp, uh, you probably have some common idea of what the color um, is and you can define that independently of any specific property action or um, event. So the, the SDF specification is uh, just a, a JSON uh, document and actually it can be multiple JSON documents linked together with uh, uh, JSON pointers so that there is some reusability uh, between uh, the specifications. So when we talk about uh, these interaction patterns, we, we have properties, we have actions, uh, we have events, and these, these are somewhat related to the interaction patterns we have in different models. So for instance, in the REST model that is underlying HTTP and CoAP, um, a property would uh, have its value examined using a get uh, operation, or you would write a value into a property with put, you would uh, do a post to, to start an action. So a coffee machine might have an action, uh, make me a coffee, and uh, that, that would be done with post. And then there are events which are not really that 
great uh, that great uh, done in such a great way in the REST um, environment because in the REST model the initiative is always with the client, uh, while with the event the initiative is with a thing. Yeah, and then there are input and output uh, values, but this is essentially the the overall structure of uh, SDF here. Uh, so, for instance, an, an action um, is uh, comparable to a REST post. It, it's a client initiative. It has some input data and some output uh, uh, data. Um, and uh, we have um, other uh, types, properties. Uh, properties actually in uh, some extension of the REST environment also have observability. So you can have some initiative on the uh, server side on the thing um, aside. I don't want to go into the details because of lack of time, but I want to talk about events uh, briefly. Uh, so an event is uh, comparable to, to an uh, observe notification, uh, but it also can be uh, more precious. So if, if uh, an event is somebody put in a coin into the vending machine, uh, that, that has different I cannot use the word property yet now, uh, different characteristics uh, than uh, s simply observing uh, the vending machine and uh, looking whether there, there is a coin being processed right now or not. So that, that my, uh, makes an event different uh, from a property, but uh, they, they're actually pretty isomorphic on the specification level. So finally, we have uh, data, uh, and uh, the data uh, is mainly in STF. Mainly, is defined by their shape. Uh, we also need some way to to add semantics uh, to them, but we, we we have a pretty rich uh, RDF environment we can uh, use for that. And the data shapes are uh, defined in a curated subset of the terms defined by JSONSchema.org. Uh, and we have a few more terms that, that are STF specific, uh, such as content format, which is something that, that is uh, uh, specific to REST uh, uh, data and so on. So uh, together with these data, uh, we expect to have uh, something we call mapping information, which might include protocol bindings in the next version of SDF. But uh, right now we are describing the thing independent of uh, specific uh, protocols. One observation here is that we, we are using JSON schema org style data modeling, um, but um, with some SDF qualities. Uh, but in reality, what we are trying to model here is an information model. So we are um, slightly abusing JSON schema org uh, to, to get uh, the information model level information that we actually want to model. But it turns out that that works reasonably well. So um, we, we, we stick with this uh, right now. Yeah, and, and of course you can do um, a lot of, of interesting things here. So for instance, there is an OCF model for, for types of batteries. And uh, you, on the lower right, you can see what types they actually have. And uh, that's actually a taxonomy and, and maybe having an uh, enum for that is not the best way of doing that. Um, so th there certainly can be improvements uh, in the long run, but uh, it, it, it interoperates with the OCF model as it is. So last slide, um, from a, a UML diagram point of view, uh, we have uh, things which are complete uh, items. Uh, and uh, these have uh, objects, SDF objects, uh, which are not JSON schema org objects, but, but uh, objects in the SDF uh, sense, which have properties, actions, and events. And these properties, actions, and events then in turn are based on, on SDF data. So if I had uh, 20 more minutes, I would now thro throw lots of JSON uh, at you. Uh, but I think you can uh, approximately imagine how, how this looks like um, as a, a specification document. So this was a really quick introduction. Any direct questions to this?
Okay. So I think we can go to the next item. Let me unshare my screen. So, Patrick, can, can you share your slides? <clears throat> so I think we may still have the issue with the audio video. So, Carson, if you can actually share the slides and Patrick can tell when to change them. Sure. Thanks. So that's the experiences one, right? Yes. Okay. There we are. Just tell me when to go ahead. And Petri, we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, there's a little bit exercising here to get everything working, or almost everything. So please, uh, Ari, if you can change the slides, so that I can't do now. All right. So I'm Petr Lari. I work at the Ericsson Research in Finland, and uh, we already got, got some info from the SDF part. So I will go to the tool work that we have been doing to make tools convert data models between different IoT ecosystems and SDF. The main idea here has been that uh, we support SDF standardization uh, and we distribute the knowledge of SDF with the tools and also that support the digital twin work. More about that in the BINS presentation soon. <clears throat> Some of the tools have been published for our others to experiment in Ericsson Research GitHub. And uh, yeah. So in this presentation, we will go more uh, to see how we can support digital twins and what challenges we have had actually during the implementation work. Okay, next slide. Thanks. Uh, this is a very short intro to digital twin definition language, so DTDL. And DTDL is created by Microsoft and it's used mainly in Azure digital twins definitions. It's an open source modeling language and it can be it can describe uh, IoT devices, digital twins, and also systems of digital twins. Uh, what is, what's important for digital twins, it supports relationships and linking data with JSON-LD. Uh, please, next. So here is a high level view how or what DTDL actually defines. So on top of there, we have the interface, which actually is defining the, uh, the entity what we are talking about, usually a sensor, for example. Uh, there we have interaction capabilities. We have telemetry for the device to send information by itself to the network. A command, which is used to send commands towards the device. And then we have properties, which are some readable or writable information on the device. Uh, the relationship defines relations to other interfaces external of this interface. Uh, then there is still the component that can be used to build more complex entities by adding other interfaces to this interface. Uh, on the bottom, we have schemas, different kinds of schemas. Uh, there are simple ones, for example, inter integers and uh, strings. Then we have there are more complex schemas such as enumeration and arrays. Uh, please jump to next and next. Uh, here we have a table that shows the general mapping between different entities 
in different ecosystems and SDF. On top, we have here now an atomic entity, um, or sorry, um, we have this uh, object. I can't now see the slide, unfortunately. <laughs> so we have in IPSO, we have this object, which is defining basically one atomic component. Uh, the corresponding in, in SDF is SDF object. And in DTDL, we have this interface that was actually shown in, in the previous slides. Uh, these are quite clearly map, mappable to each other. And there's no, much, not much difference in that level. Next slide, please. Now, each of these uh, components uh, consists of uh, some affordances. Uh, we have here the trivial ones. We have resources in IPSO smart objects, which can be readable and writable or executable. Uh, in SDF, we have SDF property and SDF action uh, that are mapped to those resources. And further in DTDL, we have property and command. So these are very trivial ones, basically, that you can easily convert from one to another. Then we have two uh, below there, which are not that uh, directly mappable, So, but I will come back to those later. Uh, next slide, please. Now it's uh, sometimes useful to combine these atomic objects into larger units. Uh, this can be, exam for example, weather measurement device it, that has uh, temperature, humidity, and air pressure sensors. Uh, now, when we are combining these, we can actually define one data model for the whole device, which makes it much easier to deploy, for example, to an, to an IoT platform. Uh, in IPSO, this is defined as a composite object so that we can create a new object and add their existing objects. Um, in SDF, we have a called SDF thing containing multiple SDF objects. And further in DTDL, we have an interface again, that can contain additional interfaces using component definition. So basically, there is a similar functionality in all, all of these. Uh, next slide, please. This is a very simple snippet of the temperature sensor IPSO object. And uh, here we can see that the resources, two of them, which is a sensor value and the reset min and max measured values, they map directly to SDF properties, sensor value and SDF action reset min and max values. Most of the uh, data models are on this level that are really simply mappable to each other in other ecosystems also. So we all, always say like roughly 80% of the models are this easy to do. But on the next slide, we can go into more challenging and more interesting things. Uh, There can be either uh, incompatible affordances or completely missing affordances between different IoT ecosystems. Now, when we are talking about incompatible affordances, there may be that same functionality exists in different ecosystems, but for example, it is not modeled explicitly in the data model in another ecosystem. This makes it, uh, in a way, when it's in the data model, it's easy to convert from X data model to SDF. But if it's not uh, in the model in Y, then it may be a little trickier to convert from SDF to Y. One example of this is the DTDL telemetry. And that, ma that maps directly to SDF event in SDF. But in IPSO, this is not modeled in the data model itself, but it's implemented using uh, 
lightweight machine to machine send interface. So same functionality exists, but it's defined different ways. Then if we have missing or incomplete affordances, why th this would happen? Uh, there may be some ecosystem specific features somewhere that are required to be defined in one ecosystem, but in some other ecosystem, it may be that that is not uh, that's not existing at all because it hasn't been required there. So, how what can we handle these cases? Uh, of course, SDF needs to support uh, this kind of extension also, and uh, we have now also thought that we can actually design in the other ecosystems or request uh, the standardization organizations if there is a need for such feature also in that. In that way, we could in the future possibly make the data model ecosystem, different ecosystems, data models more compatible with each other, which would make it much easier to work uh, or make the conversions between the data models. So, uh, on the next slide, we have one example of uh, such, such affordance. So, DTLDL defines arbitrary relations between entities using the relationships. Uh, this is an important feature in digital twins world, and uh, in IPSO, there is a limited support using object links, but that's not exactly the same one. So what we were making here when creating the tools, uh, we first figured out that, okay, SDF, the first version didn't actually support any similar operations. So we, are, we have been working with an extension called SDF relation to add this support also to the, future versions of SDF. Mm, our DTDL to SDF tool actually implements already this one, this feature, and we are currently working on an IETF draft on that topic. So in general, the relationships uh, can be quite uh, rich. We have the easiest ones are to talk about the physical relations, which is something is inside something and something is next to something. Then we have functional relations. So this device can control the other one. But then there's a semantic relations. So basically what are certain affordance means for the other host? So that is quite rich way of describing and what we have been thinking here already that basically the same mechanism to trans transform from one data model to another, we can still um, maintain the same mechanism to do the translation and then use some other ontologies, for example, to define what the relations are actually. On the next slide, we have uh, our uh, very short intro to the uh, SDF uh, relation extension. So on the top right corner, we have an SDF thing, robot arms containing three different robot arms. And uh, on the left, we have the JSON file. And on top, we have the namespaces that we are actually using. The terms is basically referring to our example com uh, relations terms, which defines some kind, what kind of relations these uh, different uh, SDF objects can have with each other. And uh, one ontology, for example, where the relations are defined quite well is the Etsy Saref ontology, which can also be used here if needed. On the actual file size, the SDF thing contains robot arms or it defines robot arms. It contains SDF object arm A, which is the leftmost object here in the picture. And 
there we define the SDF relation, which is next to, and we the type is next to something, and the target is arm B. So this is quite a trivial way of doing that. And the same goes for also SDF objects B and C. Okay, then we can go to next and next, basically. So uh, the tools, what we have been developing. Uh, on top, we have these, our public releases. They are in the Ericsson Research GitHub repository, which is the, in the github.com. And we have their IPSO and DTDL to and from SDF conversions. Then we have their SDF thing creator, which actually can use to combine multiple unique SDF objects into an SDF thing. In addition, there's the model validator, which can be used to check that if the uh, SDF model is valid. In addition, we have been experimenting internally with OPC UA and NGSI LD converters. And also we have an open API and GraphQL API converters. If you're interested, you can go and try these conversion tools. There's a wish in nomadic.com link there. And uh, there are both IPSO and DTDL tools from us. And then there's Web of Things and Young tools from University of Bremen. So you can test how they convert to SDF and the other. Uh, data models. Okay, and next, next. So basically, the key takeaways, uh, we can use SDF with digital twin languages such as DTDL, and we can provide systems descriptions on DT ecosystems. We have created tools to do conversions of data models between different ecosystems and SDF. And also one nice thing is that we can contribute to the standards organizations when some missing features would make sense in the future. Thank you. There's also some references on, on the bottom, but thank you. That was quickly the one, I guess we are running out of time soon. We have still been coming. Thank you, Petri. So are there some, some direct questions? We, we should still have a little segment for discussions at the end. Michael? Two, two quick points. Uh, this is fine. Um, and, and you know, I've been working with, with uh, these folks on this idea also. I'm also modeling a, a digital twin system um, for my employer, Passive Logic. Unfortunately, I'm not able to share any of the, the details until we get some more uh, agreements in place, but I make a lot of use of this relation type. And I found it, um, I'm considering a property graph format where I add an additional um, value into the link. And I also distinguish between the class and the instance in the target. So, um, but I wanted, I wanted everyone to hear that because there's some ongoing stuff that might be controversial. So. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm involved in driving that forward also, and um, let's let's make sure we get the use case for that uh, nailed down. Okay, thank you for the heads up, Michael. I think we can have a look into what you are doing at our next meeting. We might want to pick this up in the next wishing meeting in, in two weeks from now, um, actually. So uh, please uh, start preparing slides. <laughs> <clears throat> so finally, Bin, do you want to share your slides or do you want me to do that? Uh, yes, I can share the slides. Uh, ah, okay. It's better you share the slides. Thanks. Okay, there we are. Yes, thank you. So uh, the presentation is about building digital twins on the interoperable IoT technologies. So uh, which we can see from next slide starting. Yeah, thanks. First, a bit, a little bit introduction. Uh, what is the digital twin based on IoT platform referred to? 
So IoT-based uh, um, digital twin uh, means a virtual representations of real world uh, entities. Uh, primarily, the entities are primarily about OTs, operational technologies, and the pro processes based on IoT platform. And then synchronized as a, a specific, specified frequency and the fidelity to serve different industry applications. So I, a digital twin based on the IoT device platform uh, for us, we can see it as an enabler for various industry applications, uh, a broader use cases, basically. And the IoT based digital twin is to present the uh, and interconnections with the physical devices and operational technologies to capture the environment status, of course, IoT based. And then the IoT, and then it is also a tool to provide and the user, uh, oh, we can say industry applications with useful insights and automation capabilities and some other wanted capabilities to meet the end user needs without uh, to dealing with low level data and events uh, because that's managed by iot platform and iot based digital twin act as a layer of abstraction between physical devices and end user centric interest providing capabilities such as automation emulation for industry applications and on the small graph you could see that uh, the uh, digital twin uh, uh, IoT-based digital twin platform is connecting to the northbound of uh, um, IoT platform. And that uh, between that, we have the interoperability enablers, for example, SDF, working to, uh, to support that. We can see, uh, understand a bit more in the next slide. Yes, uh, and first, there are some core features that we need or information. Uh, we need for, to build up a digital twin based on the IoT platform. First is the device-related information, meaning these device descriptions, device-related environment context descriptions, and so on. And we know that uh, the heterogeneity of device on the IoT platform it has itself will make the digital twin facing heterogeneity uh, challenges. So that is something need to be addressed. And IoT device measurement is another thing, uh, data we needed to, or information we needed to pull into the platform. Measurement of data collected from IoT devices and different types of sensors or any devices connecting to the IoT platform. And in that case, light-weighted light weighted transport mechanism for, are needed, especially for handling those time series data for feed into uh, digital twin uh, components. And uh, also logic purpose for from uh, industry applications, uh, that is to tell the digital twin uh, platform about what is the requirements or needs for, for industry applications, basically how we want you to serve. Uh, we could go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, and so, so by so far you could see we, we needed to address some heterogeneous challenge uh, when it comes to the digital twin, uh, and primarily about relating to the uh, <coughs> heterogeneity of IoT device platform. Uh, and the data objects generating from those heterogeneous devices came into different uh, templates and formats and so on. And usually we prefer those things to be addressed in the early phase. Because when the platform scale up and the heterogeneity will getting even more complicated. And handling those uh, heterogeneity in the late phase will uh, actually be expensive. It costs extra time and the resources and so on. So the, I, I took uh, the previous picture here with emphasizing on the interoperability enabler, which is something uh, I would say supporting digital twin, but on the residing on the IoT platform side. And next slide, please. And so what we did here uh, is that there have been some exercises uh, and work has happened that we use uh, SDF and SENDM to, to support the digital implementation. And the, in that uh, SDF serves as an as a intermediate data object the translator so that the heterogeneous data objects from IoT platform can be organized in unit in a uniform format. 
uh, and also so that SDF work with IoT device platform uh, to handle heterogeneity in early phase before we feed all the data objects into the um, uh, digital twin component. So that is something to save uh, some time and extra resources in early phase in an efficient way. And besides the IoT platform in text device related data objects and using SDF uh, and other functionality modeling components, function, uh, functionality components in digital twin can also interact with SDF as well. So those components are, uh, for example, taking our objects, data objects using SDF and so on, and providing automations, uh, functionalities, and for simulation or for emulations and so on. Uh, and the, moreover, we also did uh, using the SendML for the lightweight data measurement collection for uh, digital twin <clears throat> platform. And as mentioned uh, in the previous slides, as one of the core features, uh, the uh, data measurement is something we need and better to being uh, lightweighted and uh, in a good uh, sequence. And uh, we think it's a good combination with uh, uh, SDF as well. So that's all the uh, presentation I have. We can have some quest time for questions. So questions for Bin? Michael. Yeah, I'm sure this would be a longer discussion, but I'm kind of wondering um, whether on your digital twin side, whether you still deal with the diversity of models, like um, just converted to SDF, but you still have you know a, a diversity of models, or whether you also translate to a set of very simple models on the digital twin side. And that's probably a longer discussion, but I think it's a, an interesting topic. Thanks, a uh, very good question. So first, uh, uh, when you refer about models, uh, I hear understand is about data models. Uh, and of course, we, we, if we look at it before uh, on a slide, there being, uh, let's say, we're plugging our digital twin platform based on IoT platform. So, so that the models we've been looking into and pulling into the, in the digital twin platform part will be more at once the functionality related or I call it advanced capability, automation and emulation things and so on. And so that the data related models are more happening on the uh, IoT platform side. So, uh, and if you have something, for example, uh, translating, mutually translating with SDF or some other stuff, uh, it's enough for us to take into. I don't know if I un answer your question in a good way. Yes, yes, thank you. That helps. Um, that helps a lot. I think some ongoing discussion around that would be very interesting. Thank you. Ari. Yes, th thanks, Michael. And I think like the perhaps the next wishy meeting would be a good opportunity for us to go go deeper exactly on that topic because I think it falls very, very well there. So just a, a, a quick plug on that so we're, we're planning in, in two weeks uh, to have the next wishing meeting and the information on that it's going to be going out any moment now so we can go in, in more details on that that specifics thanks so jan commented on in the chat that this is also about knowledge models on the digital twin side so maybe we can dwell on this term knowledge for a short amount of time so what, what is the kind of knowledge that we would want to support there uh, is that a question for for me or is that more for Jan <laughs> okay uh, right. let's see. no I was just saying that that uh, the, the the term model uh, have many interpretations 
And if we talk about data models that been explained is more like southbound, uh, then we can uh, have uh, ontologies that represent uh, higher abstraction of of knowledge inside a digital twin uh, that contains a lot of different types of relations that are more related to, uh, let's say, the, the end user facing aspects and interests that you have in 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 modeling uh, physical reality. But I, I guess that that is definitely a, a much longer discussion around uh, around models. But I just wanted to highlight to, to, to Michael's question, adding one component to that. Thank you. That's very uh, insightful to add the, the internal knowledge base as, as different from the, say, telemetry and control that's happening. But knowledge also tends to be associated with the system, I think more so than with individual devices. So I refer in Karsten to the fraction of knowledge that would pertain to that particular digital twin or some pointer to the system knowledge that, that it participates in. But my question was a bit about the, the issue that um, th th there's a ton of knowledge out there and um, for, for a digital twin uh, this uh, uh, the, the subject set that is actually relevant to the the physical things that it uh, manages uh, would be very useful to to be accessible and I think that that's a, an interesting observation. So um, normally, if, if you just uh, follow the graph, then then essentially you just pull in everything, and that may be a little bit too much to to actually do uh, useful reasoning. So that may be one of the jobs of the digital twin to to keep the relevant knowledge uh, accessible uh, to inference. Karsten, if you <clears throat> go back to the uh, to the flock of birds model, um, each you know element in the flock has some local knowledge, but it almost seems like you need you know to stand apart or stand above the whole subsystem, you know, to see the whole picture. Maybe that's the role of the orchestrator. I don't know, or maybe you can just discover whatever you need to discover in order to, to form that whole picture of the flock. Not really sure, but I, you know, obviously there's a, there's a, you know, this, uh, the knowledge as it were is um, distributed and, you know, how do you knit it all together into a whole picture? That's I think an, an interesting question. Yeah. If I can just chime in, that's, that's the, the whole notion of, focusing on the relationship between systems and essentially not just recognizing that there's value in those relationships, which has been talked about in a couple of the presentations here, but also to model it so they can be uh, easily uh, uh, instantiated when needed and automated. Because if you think about the dynamics of digital twin and IoT that last over years and, and decades, you really have to have a mechanism that can model how things plug into each other. So um, I just wanted to chime in on that. So there's always a challenge in doing digital twins. You want to avoid a one for one model that is complex as whatever it is you're modeling, including all the flaws and errors and defects in the current modeled system. Um, because then it's you've just got the complexity, the, the simplifying it, the abstraction. I like the notion perhaps of SDF being in between uh, twins when they're talking to them. That's a that's a potentially very exciting model. But but you always want to step back and say, what am I doing this twin for? What is its purpose? And how how much of a slice through the life of this twin do I want to take that's actually useful? And I think that's the art of digital twin right there. Over.
Okay, thank you. I think we, we have exhausted uh, our time, but we should uh, briefly talk about what we are going to do um, next. Um, so we, we uh, have uh, various pieces of input, and the first step, of course, is collecting that um, input in the GitHub repository. So please uh, send pull requests um, for things you want to put there and, and uh, want for other people to read. Ari has mentioned that we will have a wishy meeting, which is essentially just a slightly lower profile uh, meeting than a whole research group meeting. Uh, so th those people who really care about this uh, stuff may be wanting to, to join the wishy me meeting. Two weeks from now, we will talk about um, some general work of, of defining the, the IoT standards uh, landscape, but we also uh, we'll continue this uh, uh, discussion, and, and uh, Michael Costa has already uh, hinted at, at what he has, wants to discuss in two weeks from now. So if you have additional input, we certainly can pick this up uh, the week uh, after next week. And ultimately, I think what we should discuss is, um, I mean, the, the objective of, of this meeting is to make everyone aware of what the others are doing, uh, so that, that's good. Uh, but we also should discuss, is there something li like a document we, we may want to um, have that, that collects some of this information? And these documents, of course, start by, by people submitting uh, drafts uh, and uh, having discussions about these uh, drafts. And maybe at some point, the, the research group deciding that this is a useful draft and we may want to develop this as a research a group draft, or we may want at least want to encourage the author of the draft to go ahead with it, uh, with it, even if it's not uh, exactly research group consensus um, initially. So um, yeah, and there is the mailing list. Uh, I, I would like to remind everyone that we we can have uh, very good discussions on the mailing mailing list uh, as well. So if you aren't subscribed to that uh, yet, uh, please uh, uh, do. And um, yeah, let's uh, maybe meet in two weeks in the wishy meeting and continue this discussion. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.